Hello, hello. Check, 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 check. Ah, ah. Ah, ah, ah. Check, check, check. Okay. Okay, check, 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 check. Check, check, ah, 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 check, 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 one, two, check, check, ah, 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 check, check, one, two, okay, we should be hearing this, all right, check, 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 ah, 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 check, check, very good, aha, check, 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 check.
Hey, flash your lights for me if you can hear me. So we're going to have live worship inside, and so that'll come out into your radios, and then we're go and then um, hey, and then this. And then the speaking will be outside.
Amen. Right, good morning. We're gonna we're gonna get started. Good morning, welcome. Um, if you want to stand or sit, whatever you're more comfortable with, um, I'm gonna stand up here and and we're gonna worship. So um, here we go. Again, welcome, and let's sing together. Lord, we sing praises to you this morning. We lift your name up high. All honor to your name this morning, Lord. All praises to you. We look to you. Renew us this morning. Encourage us, strengthen us, Lord.
So you might know this song. Um, it's called Evidence. And um, I just think it's a, it's a cool song and, and it's a cool idea to look back on your own life and um, personally and look for the evidence where the Lord was with us, the Lord was with you. Um, he was right beside you the whole time, even though you might have felt um, alone. And um, so this song speaks to that. So.
going to come up? Or no? Okay. <laughs> I can keep coming. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary. We want to thank you so much for the many ways that you're joining us this morning. We have people here in the sanctuary at Uncasville. We also have people in their cars in the parking lot. And then we know we have some of you online at home. So we just thank you for finding any way to be a part of our church and to grow by tuning in. So we just want to give you a few announcements this morning. And I'd like to first show you this video from Bags of Hope. Hold for just a moment as we sort out the sound issues. All right, we're going to hold on that video. Maybe we'll have that for you later. Uh, we want to mention a few other things. We've got an indoor service at Chapel Hill and an indoor service at Goshen Hill. And then this evening we have Recovery Church. So you have many options to join in with us. I also want to make sure everyone knows about our family Christmas Eve service that's at 6 p.m. on Christmas Eve, of course, at our Goshen Hill uh, location in Lebanon. And then I also want to make sure you know we still have small groups going on all over the place and so some of those small groups are taking place on zoom and others are meeting um, with safety precautions in place at different locations so um, go right online and you can check out where some small groups are happening if you'd like to plug in to a small group so i'll just mention a little bit about bags of hope maybe we'll show that video next week but bags of hope is a ministry here in new england um, that collects money to put together duffel bags for children in foster care here right in our own community so children in the norwich and Will willimantic offices will receive a duffel bag with their name embroidered on it inside the duffel bag there's a little blanket um, stuffed animal for the younger kids, body products for the older kids, um, and they always put in some sort of Christian book. So this is an opportunity for us to reach out and show some love to the children in our community who are in foster care. So if you have interest in supporting one of these bags being purchased, we have a table outside of the Uncasville location, and you can also go online to find ways to give to Bags of Hope. But if you're here in Uncasville, we do have a table today with a bag that you can take a look at to see what it is that you're donating toward and $25 will purchase a monogrammed bag for a child in foster care so you can feel free to donate for one bag or 10 bags whatever you'd like so check us out outside if you'd like to be a part of that ministry thank you the biggest shock for me about bags of hope is that it was never a thought or a plan John and I met, I want to say we were in junior high. We, oddly enough, as teenagers, wanted to have six kids, both of us, and always felt like we wanted to adopt as well, not realizing that after one child, we'd be adopting five. When we got the call for Shane, the foster mom says, oh wait, he has one more bag. She comes up from the basement, opens the door, and she's carrying the black trash bag. Every time he had to move, the social workers would come in and they would take his stuff and put it in a black trash bag. Families don't have luggage. And when a foster family has just gotten so burnt out that they can't take it anymore, they haven't bought the kids luggage. Trash bags are the one thing almost every home has. Your teddy bear or your blanket or your journal or whatever connects you to the people that you love. There's a million stories of this kid's trash bag got thrown out or this little girl's trash bag was misplaced. You know, and I was thinking of like my own kids. I think we just knew we had to do something, but that something truly was, we thought a small little Christmas project. <laughs> Maybe we'll do this for the families that we know. 25 like quickly grew to 100. And so that Christmas, that was the first one that we did. It was 100 bags. 
We've done it for seven years now, and this past Christmas we did 6,000. <laughs> Even if I handed you the list of all the names of all the children that were in the state of Rhode Island or Massachusetts in foster care, it's still not the same as seeing a bag for every child with their name on it piled in one huge room. Those bags become faces, and each bag has a story. We've seen over 70 kids fostered, and I think right now it's around 15 children adopted into families that got licensed to adopt because of Bags of Hope. The state is coming to us and they're like, how do you do it? Like, how do you recruit so many families? I'm like, it's the church to take care of the widow and the orphan. You know, it's our job to do that. And there's this like renewed sense of ownership to that and like an awakening to um, the need to care for these children and that the church has kind of dropped the ball a long time ago on. Most of the kids that are in foster care don't have their name on anything, and most of their names are really unique. Not all, but there's a lot of unique names. Seeing firsthand the response of kids and how excited they get that something is personal, this is just for you. For people to want to do something for the kids that I care about, that was kind of how I really connected with Bags of Hope. I didn't get into foster care with the intent to adopt. I just wanted to mother. I'm taking care of God's children. And the next child that came was Avia. One of the things that I love about Bags of Hope for Avia is there's nothing really unusual about being adopted when there are a whole bunch of kids in your community that are adopted. You're not the one kid in the entire church that isn't with your biological parents. When so many families foster, you may not even know who they are. I'm not sure that Grace realizes that our family dynamic is maybe not normal. <laughs> I think she may think that most people adopt or foster. Grace is a lot like John, the more the merrier. Not everybody can foster but everybody can have a role. You know, God is a father, you know, and even when we're like going through our stuff or even forsaking him, he still hasn't forsaken us. And I feel like it's an honor to be able to try to reflect that to children that may have felt forsaken. To be able to then say, no, this is who you are and I love you. All right, let's stand. Let's stand and sing. Uh, we're going to sing a little bit more, then we'll, um, we'll invite you up.
Bethlehem and see. Come to Bethlehem and see Him whose birth the angels see. You come adore on bended knee. You Christ the Lord, the newborn King. And go
So we're going to do a Christmas test. And I don't know how, if you're in your car, you're going to be able to uh, answer this, but maybe if you're in the sanctuary, you can shout it out, the answer. Um, but let me say this first. This is so we're going to do a Christmas test. And I don't know how, if you're in your car, you're going to be able to uh, answer this, but maybe if you're in the sanctuary, Okay, so here we go. Here's the first one. Um, and if you're in the sanctuary, shout it out. And there's people, you know, we're gathered together in a strange way, right? Um, we're in our cars. And there's a delay. If uh, you're on the internet, there's a delay. I think the radio is coming in in real time, I think. Uh, and so we're also at Chapel Hill, we're at Lebanon, we're gathered together in cars, we're gathered together on Facebook Live, we're gathered together on YouTube, we're gathered together on Church Online. Um, so we are gathered together, we are assembled. So here's the first question. And um, was Christmas first celebrated, A, A, the year after Jesus was crucified, B, around the year 100, and if you're outside in your car, you can roll down your window and shout it out in a minute. So is it A, the year after Jesus was crucified, B, around the year 100, C, in the 4th century, D, 1935, or E, when Hallmark began their card company? What is it? D, 1935? Oh, C, C, the, the 4th century, that's right. That's right, so they didn't celebrate it until then. So, uh, number two, where did the Christmas tree tradition or originate? A, Germany, B, Israel, C, New England, D, Scandinavia. Germany, Germany that's right, who said that? Woo, all right. Three, why was December 25th chosen as Christmas day? A. That's the day Jesus was born. B, to compete with pagan celebrations. C, to close schools in the winter to save on heating bills. D, that's when Christmas trees are in season. Or E, that's when the Bible says to celebrate it. The pagan thing, that's right. That's right. There was a pagan holiday and they, uh, just, they just went right over the top of it. So, oh, here's a good one. What's the significance of holly in celebrating Christmas? A, the pointed leaves represent the star of Bethlehem. B, it was mistaken for mistletoe. C, the red berries are a Christmas color. D, the early church banned mistletoe, so holly was substituted. 
A, the pointed leaves, nope. Anybody else? B, nope. D, the early church banned it, banned mistletoe, so holly was substituted. So, um, celebrating Christmas, shout this one out, celebrating Christmas was once against the law in A, Holland, B, Indiana, C, Massachusetts, D, Japan. Where, where was it? Massachusetts. That's right. That's right. There's once against the law in A, Holland, B, Indiana, C, Massachusetts, Up. D, Japan. I'm hearing myself here. Okay, so here's the next one. Christmas will soon be against the law in A, Massachusetts, B, the United States, C, all of the above, D, none of the above. <laughs> Which one? D, none of the above? All of the above. <laughs> you may be right about that. Uh, okay, so the candy cane legend says it originated with a candy maker from where? A, Indiana, B, Mexico, C, Germany, D, Turkey. Indiana. Germany, Indiana, he said. <laughs> St. Nicholas was born in what country? A, the North Pole, B, Holland, C, Germany, or D, Turkey. D, that's right, Turkey. And here's the last one. There you go. How did Joseph and Mary travel to Bethlehem? A, in a Volkswagen, B, on a donkey, C, on a camel, D, they walked, E, Joseph walked and Mary rode a donkey, F, Mary walked and Joseph rode a donkey, or G, who knows? E, Joseph walked and Mary rode a donkey? Yes. We don't really know. It doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us. So we are looking at Luke chapter 1. And we're going to talk a little bit about Christmas. And we're going to start with the story of Mary. You ready to try the story of Mary? Luke 126. And at least outside it's difficult to uh, have anybody shout out and read the scripture. But uh, I'll read it to you. So if you have a Bible, turn to Luke 1, 26, and we'll get all of this craziness worked out. Sorry about all the confusion. And I was watching the worship on the live stream while I was sitting out here. So I could see it. I could see the lyrics. I could watch what was going on inside because they're doing the worship inside and there's people sitting inside. And then uh, we're doing the teaching outside and then the people inside are watching the teaching outside and then people are on the live stream. So... All, all a lot of fun, all a lot of confusion, but we are getting it. We are doing it. COVID will not keep us down. That's all there is to it. So, 126, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin who was pledged to, to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. That virgin's name was Mary. Anybody know? Shout it out in your car. Do you know what the name Mary meant in the day? Anybody know what that name means? The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly troubled at these words, and she wondered what kind of greeting must this be? But the angel said to her, do not be afraid. Most times when uh, angels appear in the scripture, they tell people to not be afraid simply because people were probably afraid, afraid of the encounter, afraid of what's going on, afraid of you know, what the angel might be saying to them. But here's what the angel said to Mary. Mary, you have found favor with God. 
you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will call him Jesus. And he will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. So this is a forever king. His kingdom will never end. The Christmas story starts out kind of interesting in that it, in that it begins with this king, Herod, and Herod's a king who thinks that he's all powerful. In fact, we'll see that next week when he makes all of Rome go back to their hometowns. But there's a king greater than King Herod. There's a king greater than the Emperor Nero. And it's Jesus who will come, whose kingdom will never, ever end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so that the Holy One to be, to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. It was her relative, John the Baptist. For no word from God will ever fail. There we go. If that's all we said today, no word from God will ever fail. We would have said it all. I am, Mary says, I am the Lord's servant. I am the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled to me. And then the angel left her. So we're going to come back to that one where may the Lord's will be done. Whatever you've said, you know, let that be done. So Mary is a hot topic in the church. And if you're a uh, a Christian and have been in the church world for any amount of time at all, you know that Mary is debated a lot. There's a big debate between, you know, the Bible believing Christians and the Protestants and the Catholics and the, you know, where does, where does Mary fit? She is a, she is a hot topic. And if you talk about Mary, you're bound to start something. So, um, we're going to talk about eight things eight things that the scriptures do not teach about Mary because there's a lot of things that are just sort of there just like the Christmas account there's a lot of things that are in our mind that we pick up somewhere about Christmas that we pick up somewhere about Mary so um, the first thing that we're going to say and, and we don't want to spend a lot of time on what the scripture doesn't say about Mary but we want to take some of that and deconstruct some of that for one reason primarily, and that's that people like Mary, people like Peter, people like Paul, we tend to take those people and, and elevate them as though they're different than other human beings. The Apostle Paul, Peter, Mary, they were all just human beings. In fact, in the book of James, when he's talking about Elijah, one of the most powerful prophets in uh, the Old Testament, James says that he was a man of like passions just like us. He had emotions just like us. He was a person just like us. And Mary, somehow she gets elevated to the place that she's beyond just being a person, beyond just being a human, beyond just being somebody that's in the community, beyond be just somebody being sitting in their car you know, standing out in the, uh, you know, here in December in a parking lot or sitting in a sanctuary um, watching during COVID and all of the strangeness. It's just, she's just a human. She's a person. And so we want to level that ground. But when we get to the second part, we're going to see how God used this person, how God used this girl. So eight things that the scriptures don't teach about Mary and, and the first one is that she is not a spokesperson for God giving current revelation. There's a lot of talk about Mary, you know, comes and Mary appears and Mary speaks. Well, Mary, Mary died. Mary is in heaven. And nowhere are we told that that's ever going to happen, that she's some special ongoing spokesperson for God. Nowhere in the scripture does she speak as a prophetess when she's, uh, when she's, when she's alive. Um, God does speak to people. She writes a song. God does speak to people today, um, but not through departed souls, 
not through departed souls. The Spirit speaks through the Word, and, and, the, and the Spirit speaks through Christian people to people. So number one, she's not some ongoing spokesperson for God. Number two, um, she did not, according to Scripture, have her body assumed into heaven without seeing death. There's a tradition about Mary that she, she just ascended, she ascended into heaven, um, like, uh, like Elijah or Enoch. Well, um, even the son didn't have that experience. And that doctrine, interestingly enough, uh, came into play in 1954. 1954. If you grew up Catholic like I did, you know, I heard that, you know, I understood that, I believe that. But it's, it's, a, it's a new doctrine. It happened, you know, in, in the lifetime of many of us that that started being taught. And so when Jesus died on the cross, he entrusted his mom to John. And we are told that, that she stayed with him until that time, until the time of her death. So also, now here's a tricky one. This is a tricky one, and we'll play with it again when we get into what the Scripture does say about Mary in this passage here. So the Bible does not teach that she's the mother of God. Well, that's an interesting one because Jesus is God in the flesh, and she's the one that bore Jesus, but God is from everlasting to everlasting without beginning, without end. She did not give birth to God, to the, to the Trinity, to the Father, the Son, the Spirit. Uh, the Bible teaches that God is eternally existing in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Um, God existed before Mary. And uh, so the third thing, the fourth thing, I'm sorry, is that by virtue of her physical connection to Jesus doesn't give her any, any special intercessory privileges or powers. Because of her relationship to Jesus, she doesn't have any special intercessory privileges or powers. <laughs> well, um, that's why you remember they came, they came up to Mary, you know, hoping maybe Jesus would, would do something. But on the contrary, all believers, every single one of us, has special intercessory privileges and powers. All of us. Just like Mary, Mary had the same access to God that we have in prayer. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, not in the name of Mary. In fact, there's an amazing account in, in Matthew's Gospel where Jesus is inside of a house. And it says that his mothers and his brothers and his sisters, he had sisters too, brothers and sisters, uh, they came looking for him, but Jesus was in the house and they couldn't get in. There's too many people there. Those are small houses anyway, so don't imagine it's, uh, you know, as big as some of the houses that maybe we had. But Jesus is in there, they're trying to get in, and then they told Jesus that your mother and your brothers and your sisters are looking for you. And Jesus, they were sitting in a circle is what it looks like, all, all sitting around him. And Jesus asked this question, he said, who's my mother? Who's my brothers? And he pointed to the disciples, pointed to you, pointed to me, pointed to us. And, and he said, here's my mother, here's my brothers, for whoever does the will of my father is my mother and my brother and my sister. So Mary said, be it according to your will, be it according to your word. Well, that makes her a brother, sister, mother to Jesus. And so the same with us. The, the, the fifth thing about Mary that we're looking at on Christmas, having finished our Genesis study spending a couple of weeks on Christmas here, is that she was not born free of sin. That's a doctrine that I heard growing up. You know, Mary was born free of sin. It's known as the Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception. Well, that's a relatively new doctrine as well. It's about 150 years old. Um, and, and the idea was presented earlier in the early church, but they rejected it. It was rejected in the second century. It was rejected by the early church. And the sixth thing is, we're going to do eight about Mary, eight things that are not true about her that the Scripture does not teach. The sixth one is that she was not a perpetual virgin. She was not a perpetual virgin. We call her the Virgin Mary. Well, she, Jesus was born of a virgin, but Mary had sons and daughters after Jesus. Imagine growing up in the household with Jesus. <laughs> Jesus being your brother, you know, uh, unbelievable. So, and and the, the, the number seven is Mary's not a co-redeemer. Some people think you can get redemption through Mary. 
Uh, but it's said of Jesus that he's the one who holds that office. He's the king, he's the teacher, he's the priest, he's the savior. The amazing thing about Mary not being a co-redeemer is when she sings her song, keep reading past what we read, when she sings her song, she says that God is my savior. Jesus is the savior of Mary. That's absolutely amazing to think about. It's startling to think about, really, that, that, that Jesus is the savior of his mom. Um, and then number eight, Nowhere, does it, nowhere is she called the Blessed Virgin Mary, but she is called blessed. But it's not the Blessed Virgin Mary. Although those three words are used of her, they're never used together. So let's, um, let's go back to the scripture here for a minute. Now that we got rid of what she's not, all of those things, and why, why do people assign all of those things to her? Because somehow we take people in the Bible and we make them superhuman. We make Paul superhuman. We make Peter superhuman. We make Mary superhuman. They're people just like us, just like James said. People of like passions. People just like you, just like me. Same emotions, same difficulties, same struggles. Well, what we do know about her in verse 29 is that she had an angelic visitation. The angel Gabriel, or Gabrielle, however you might want to say that. That's the same angel that appeared earlier, six months earlier, to Elizabeth, who's going to have John the Baptist. Here's an interesting thing that happens in the Old Testament. Between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's 400 years. And they call those the 400 silent years. What do they mean by that? It means there's no scripture, there's no prophets, there's no periods of miracles. And... When Jesus is getting ready to come on the scene, one of the things that happens when the New Testament opens up is there's angelic activity everywhere. Angels all over the place. Supernatural activity, prophecies starting to be fulfilled one after another in, in rapid succession. And the angel tells her that she is highly favored by God, that she's blessed, that she's blessed. But that word is used of all believers in Ephesians. We're all favored by God. Favor and grace is about the same word. So the angel Gabriel, there's lots of angels around the birth of Jesus. So eight things that aren't true about her, ten that are. Number two is that we know that Mary, from verse 26 here, we know that Mary comes from an obscure, insignificant town. Well, a lot of us have come from obscure, insignificant towns. And that, that should identify us with, with, with Jesus as well. Um, you know, this whole thing of being ordinary people. Nazareth is off the beaten path. Nazareth is off the trade routes. Nazareth is an area surrounded by Gentiles. And of course, the Hebrew people of the day, they didn't like being surrounded by Gentiles. So Nazareth isn't, it's not the place. It's not the happening place. Um, People spoke scornfully of that town. Can any good thing come from Nazareth is one of the sayings they used to have. Can any good thing come from Nazareth? And uh, we also know that that town and the town that she came from, she was poor. She was poor. Uh, how do we know that? Because when she goes to the temple to offer the sacrifices for the child that's born, they offer the poor person's sacrifice. In the Old Testament, it gave these sacrifices you were to give, and you could give a certain sacrifice or you could give the poor person's sacrifice. She gave the poor person's sacrifice. Jesus is born into a poor family. Mary's poor. So if you're poor, you're in good company. Number three with Mary is that we know that Mary was a young Jewish virgin betrothed to this man named Joseph. Verse 27. And it might come as a surprise. Um, we said she was a young Jewish virgin. Virgin. <laughs> virgin. Uh, it might come as a surprise to some that Mary, Mary wasn't Catholic. Mary was Jewish. <laughs> uh, Mary, now this will really rock some of our sensibilities. Mary is probably 13 years old at the time. Maybe 14. Possibly 15 unlikely that she's older than 16. And you think about that, you think about your own 13-year-old you know, daughter, or your 13-year-old niece, and you think, man, you know, 
getting married at 13. Well, she's betrothed to be married, but this is an age where people didn't, didn't live long anyway. And it's an age that when you were 13, you were an adult. Still, when a, when a boy is bar mitzvahed at 13, he's an adult. He goes into the adult world. So very different for us. Uh, now we have extended adolescence where I guess you go into the adult world when you're 30 or 35 now. But <laughs> here, 13, you were an adult. Uh, and, and then this, this idea of being betrothed. What's going on with them is there's three phases to it. The first one is the engagement. What happens with the engagement? That's the formal family agreement. And then the betrothal is that you have a ceremony made with promises. So in other words, the families work it out and the families did work it out in the day. They're going to get married and then they have a ceremony. And when they have that ceremony, promises are made. Promises are made. This is what's going to happen. This is how it's going to work. And it'll be about a year later that they'll get married. And, and really, nobody knew the date. That, that was, well, I guess people did, but you weren't supposed to really know the date. And it would be a surprise when, when the bridegroom comes looking for the bride. But it would be about a year later. So maybe somewhere around the time that um, they're betrothed, from the time they're engaged, in between that and the marriage is when she becomes pregnant with Jesus. And so before she's married, the miracle happens. The fourth thing about Mary is that she becomes the mother of Jesus. So there you go, well, what a mother of God, mother of Jesus. You know, it says here, verses 29 through 37. Interesting observation. Here's a really interesting observation is at what point did Jesus or John become humans? Because that's a big... Uh, that's a big debate, a big scientific debate. John is six months old. If you read those verses again and read a little bit further, John is six months in the womb. And when Elizabeth comes in the room and Mary comes in the room, Elizabeth is pregnant with John. John leaps inside of her womb. It says that John was filled with the spirit when he was in the womb. John's an emotional being when he's in the womb. When he leaps, when Jesus comes in the room, he's nine inches, one and a half pounds. Um, and so the fifth thing is Mary's full of faith and she's full of obedience. What does she say in verse 38 there, verse 38, verse 39? She's available and she's willing. She's available and she's willing. And there's the application for us because she's just like us. Why did God use her? She's available and she's willing. She's a relative of Elizabeth. The, the New Testament, when we read it again, we take these people and we make them sort of mythical in a way. They're superheroes. They're people unlike us. But they're just like us. They're just like us. And in many of the people in the scriptures, it was family. Uh, James and John. Peter and Andrew. Jesus and his, and his brothers. And his brother ends up later on you know, being involved in the writing of scripture and in the the leadership of the early church. So we're going to read a little bit further. If you turn back there again, hopefully I can find it for you. Mary writes this song, and we're just going to say a little bit about the song here that she writes. And there you go, verse 39, that's where John leaps. In verse 46, Mary said, watch this, my soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Jesus would become his mother's Savior. Wrap your head around that one. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. She is blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. Yes, exactly. Because we're going to see that Herod thinks he's the all-powerful emperor, making everybody go back to their hometowns. Well, God is more powerful than Herod, and he's using Herod to fulfill prophecies. 
Herod thinks he's doing it all on his own. God is using him. People are all worried, you know, what's going on right now? What's going on in the nation? What's going on in the world? What's going on with leaders? God is in control. I can promise you that. God is in control. There's no doubt about it. God is in control. We just need to simmer down, calm down. God is in control. So he has brought down rulers from their thrones. He has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. He has made the, sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. You know what's going on here with Mary? Mary has an, a great grasp of the scriptures, has a huge grasp of the scriptures. She learned the scriptures. She's 13 years old. She knows the scriptures. This song is full of scripture. It's full of the history of Israel. Um, it's, a, it's a model for all praise songs. Magnify the Lord with me. Make the Lord bigger. 15 Old Testament references. If we had to write a song, if we all went inside, sat around tables, let's, let's write a song. Would we come up with 15 Old Testament references? Do we know 15 Old Testament references between us? But she gives praises for what God has done, and she celebrates his goodness, she celebrates his faithfulness, she celebrates his power. And, and then, she, then she talks about, here's the application. Where's the drive at home? Where's the Christmas story for 2020? It's in Mary's song. It's in Mary's song. She talks about the futility of trusting in political powers, the futility of trusting in yourself, the futility of trusting in riches. And then she says there's three groups of people that God helps. This lady's a theologian. This lady's a preacher. This is a 13-year-old girl, ordinary, just like you and me, from an obscure town, an insignificant town, surrounded by Gentiles, looked down on by, by everyone else, a city of scorn, um, and, and she's able to, to, to write all of this. And this is who she says that God shows mercy to. He shows mercy to the helpless. He shows mercy to the humble. He shows mercy to the hungry. And she magnifies the Lord. She makes the Lord bigger. Magnify the Lord with me. Make the Lord bigger. Not myself, but the Lord in her song. Um, we know that Mary was a sinner. Verse 47, she needs a savior and that she was finally the subject of suspicion and ridicule. You keep reading on. Tongues were wagging. All through her life, people would be talking about, you know, you weren't, you weren't even married when you had that child. And then here's the last thing about Mary is that she gave the best advice in the Bible. She gave the best advice in the Bible. The wedding feast of Cana, when uh, they had run out of the wine and they come up and they say, you know, what are we going to do? She says to the servants, go see Jesus and whatever he tells you to do, you do it. Whatever he tells you to do, you do it. But let's talk about Mary for a minute because we made her human because she is human. Then she says, your will be done in my life. Your will be done. And so there's the, there's the application for us, is that just like Mary, we don't, trust, uh, we don't trust in what? We don't trust in riches. We don't need to trust in people. We don't need to trust in powers. We trust in God. And so your will be done. Your will be done. So I don't know if we're going to close with a song. Um, I should turn this on and see. <laughs> we didn't talk about that part, but I'm just going to close for us. I'm going to, I'm going to pray for us and close. And uh, if, we, if we close with a song, then, then we close with a song. So um, the futility of trusting in political powers, the futility of trusting in yourself, the futility of trusting in riches. So, Lord, here we are. Here we are. In December of, 2000, of, of 2020, December 2020, and Lord, what a year it has been with COVID and then uh, all of the unrest this summer, everything that was going on this summer and the division and, the, um, and people at each other. 
Lord, you are still on the throne and you are still looking for servants who say, here I am, I am willing. Here I am, I am willing. And so, Lord, we at the end of this year, looking forward to the beginning of the next, we tell you that we're willing. We're willing. We will be your servant. We will serve you however you want us to serve you. We are change in your pocket. You can spend us however you want to spend us. And Lord, we, we will not trust in the arm of flesh. We will not trust in the political powers. We will not trust in ourselves. We will not trust in riches. We will trust in you. And Lord, whatever you give us, whatever comes by your hand, we will accept it. And so use us in this time. Use us in this day. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. And so everybody says, Amen, I guess. Amen. <laughs> I don't know what the neighbors will think about that, but it'll be okay. So uh, I guess we're going to close with a song. So if you stay on, uh, there, should be, there should be a song coming on. And I watched that the whole time. Um, <laughs> let's see if it's coming on. Is it coming on? Somebody should...
safe. See you next week.